Okay, so we've looked at lots of things that are related to distribution, but uh, not in the core of distributed computing. We haven't really talked of inter of distributed programs. We haven't talked of process to process communication. Okay, but, we, but we know that when you do process to process communication, we need to do a lot of concepts and we looked at them. Okay, so we've done the background material for it. So now it's time to go and look at, at, at a particular form of inter process communication called RMI which is what you will use for assignment three, okay? That's an example of a general concept, that's called remote method invocation, it's Java's RMI. That's an example of a more general concept of remote procedure call, which happens to be uh, an example of something even more general, which is inter-process communication, okay? So this is the path we'll take to study RMI, okay? So um, let's remind ourselves of how, where, where distributed systems stand in relation to two related fields, operating systems and networking. So I've, I've told you how the relationship between threads and, and distributed systems, and we've looked at threads in, in, in some depth. Okay. And uh, the other pillar on which distributed system stands is networking. And those of you who've done networking courses are probably feeling cheated at this so far because your knowledge has not been tested. Okay. So now it's time for you to show off. Okay. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, again, to remind you that uh, how, how these two fields uh, really relate to distributed computing, that uh, operating systems is, is involved in blocking and unblocking, okay. and networking is involved in communication, and in distributed layers, we're going to do blocking and unblocking that involves communication. That's a very direct relationship, and also we saw that uh, generally, a process that's communicated with another process will have multiple threads in it. That will that, be synchronized. Okay, and threads are provided by operating systems. Okay? So personally, I feel OS people are at a bigger advantage than networking people. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully I've, I've given enough material for both groups of students to understand the concepts. Okay. So, um, networking involves distributed communication. Um, distributed systems involve distributed communication. So, um, what's the difference? Um, in one case, we are communicating from host to host in networking, and in, in uh, distributed computing, we are com communicating from process to process, okay? Using some IPC mechanism, okay? Mechanism for inter-process communication. So, that's a term that you might or might not have heard before you came to this class, uh, but um, many of you have probably written some distributed program or some distributed program. Some of you might have heard about these concepts. I know those of you who did programming languages with me have written distributed programs. So let me ask you guys about uh, how much you know or have used IPC mechanisms and which do you know about. Okay. So um, there's the network layer. On top of that, you can have OS layers and sockets and pipes were mentioned. And the history goes as follows. Unix invented pipes. Okay, good old 60s and 70s. And then came 4.2 BSD in the early 80s, invented by Berkeley, and it invented the concept of sockets. Okay, at that point, there were a group of, there was a lot of research groups. Uh, it was in the mid 80s, maybe 86. A lot of research groups were doing distributed computing and inventing their own alternatives to sockets. And uh, um, there was a lot of literature on this, on this subject. And sockets got invented, people looked at it and said, yuck. And suddenly all of that research that was going on just stopped. Because they might be yuck, but uh, they are still here today. They're time tested. And, 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 and so this is something in maybe 86, 84, that's still there today. Okay. And, and, and so, and then, the, then you, you mentioned a lot of distributed uh, shared memory abstractions. Okay. And, and so we won't get into those. Um, but there's also, for those of you who've done Java, you didn't use Unix sockets or Linux sockets or whatever. You just use Java sockets, which happen to be built on top of Unix sockets. Okay. So as far as I know, Linux has really invented, I mean, in terms of, I mean, maybe these, um, these, these shared memory abstractions came from Linux, but, but all these... Um, more what's called message passing abstractions came really from from Unix and, and other systems. Okay, 
And when you're dealing with a programming language, you needn't just go and support, provide a language veneer to something that the operating system provides, which is what Java sockets are. Okay. Uh, Java sockets are higher level. Unix sockets allow you to only send um, prim prim primitive values. Java sockets allow you to send arbitrary Java objects. So that's a very big deal. Okay. And then uh, there's something called remote method invocation, which is even a higher level abstraction, which is the one you will actually be using in your, in your assignment three. Okay. And then I mentioned NIO. NIO is also inspired by something that was in exist that exists in, in Unix and something that Java had hidden from the language. And Java then went and uh, has gone and created a nice abstraction to that, uh, to that particular facility that Unix provided and sockets provided. Okay, sockets were built on top of file descriptors. And so file descriptors provided this facility. And by the way, when, when Unix sockets came around, then Unix pipes got re-implemented as Unix sockets. Okay, the Unix pipe abstraction existed for since whenever Unix was invented. Uh, but uh, uh, that was the whole idea of Unix. Unix versus Multics. Multics was, was a, an academic's dream. Every concept you ever want to teach in an operating system was in, implemented in Multics. Just as a language called Ada was a programming language researcher's dream. Every concept that was ever invented in programming languages was almost put into, uh, put into Ada. And Intel 432 was an architecture on which Ada ran. And that was a hardware researcher's dream because every hardware feature you always wanted was in that system. And, and, and Intel 432 was an example of what is called CISC, complex instruction set. And the reaction to that was RISC. Okay? The reaction to Multics was Unix. The idea was that you build small programs that do one thing, right, and, and you compose them together into bigger things. And how was the composition done? Through pipes. Okay? So pipes were a fundamental aspect of Unix. Okay. But the whole point is there's a bunch of IPC mechanisms. We won't study all of them. Um, those of you who've done 431 have done use sockets. Those of you who've done programming language have used sockets. And we will do, look at NIO and RMI, which are two ends of the spectrum, and sockets kind of follow from that. Okay. I've done in previous incarnations of this course, I've done sockets too, but I just feel given the limited time we have, I'd rather spend time on things you don't know. Okay. There so the question is, you know, why do you want to go to a higher level layer when you can do something at a lower level layer and what are the pros and cons? And these are traditional pros and cons. The lower the layer, the more flexible the system is because more layers can use that. Okay. More layers can be put on top of a lower level layer. But higher level layer can go and provide you with higher functionality. Okay. So that you have to write less code. Okay. So higher, higher abstraction. And, and so... Uh, those are the trade-offs. Okay. So we will incrementally study concepts that unite these various abstractions. Okay. And we also look at issues that separate them. And when we look at case studies, we'll start from RMI. Normally, I start from NIO. I like to go bottom-up. I'm a double E, you know, that went up the layers in software. That's how I understand the world. But uh, just based on the assignments we have, it'll make sense to... Uh, Go, go down. Okay, so from RMI we'll go to NIO. So, what is a common concept among all these mechanisms? Okay, well, they, they all provide you with inter-process communication. Okay, and whenever two process, whenever there's something between processes, uh, anything that allows communication between two process, two processes, we'll call a distributed object. Even if those two processes are uh, going to be uh, in the, on the same computer, okay? Because um, uh, in general, uh, anything that can be used to communicate among processes on different machines can also be used for communication among different hosts, so that makes sense. The reverse is not true. So pipes were mentioned. Pipes allow communication between processes on the same computer, and they don't go and extend to the distributed Uh, at least the pipes that Unix invented okay. uh, originally. So um, we have a distributed object between the processes and we are sending messages on the distributed object. Okay. So one process can go and send a message to another process 
by depositing the message with the distributed object and it can then be received by another uh, process by executing a receive operation of the distributed object. Okay, so we think of there being a send operation and a receive operation. Send object will put the message in the distributed object and the receive will take it out. Okay, this is like a mailbox that somebody puts a message in your mailbox and you can consume it. Okay. So, and, and what we're communicating between, what, what is being deposited in the object is we'll call a message. Okay. And so processes can receive a series of messages from another process. And each of these data chunks will be, will be calling a message. Okay, whatever is the argument to the send call and whatever is received from a receive call will call a message. Okay. So it's a distributed object. Um, people who've done OS are familiar with sockets and, 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 and pipes. But even if you haven't done operating systems and even if you haven't done my programming language class, I'm going to claim that all of you have seen Maybe not messages, but you have seen a distributed object before. And what is a distributed object? Something that allows communication between two, something that can be accessed by two different processes. Okay. It may or may not be an IPC mechanism. Okay. It may or may not follow this, send. it may or may not allow sends and receives. But it is an object that can be accessed by multiple processes. What's an example of that? So, you, you guys are the right, right idea, okay? Um, it, it, it is a file, it, it, a file is a good example, and uh, it can be accessed by multiple processes, and those multiple processes don't have to be in the same machine. If you have a distributed file system, such as network file system NFS, which was invented by Sun, or AFS, it can be, they can be a different, different uh, location also. So it's very important to know, uh, to use, uh, our knowledge of files is going to help us understand IPC mechanisms because files, like the distributed objects that allow message passing, uh, are both examples of distributed objects. Okay? So you're sending messages and, and so whatever is being sent is a message. So let's try to now understand I've told you that there is, there is this operation to send a message, to deposit a, a message in, a, in the distributed object and to retrieve a message from the distributed object, okay? I'm not calling this a file. I'm just saying files can be accessed by multiple processes. This distributed object, that mysterious distributed object that I've got here that allows message passing can also be accessed by multiple processes. So given what I've told you about this, how would you distinguish this distributed object from a file? Ideally using some concept that you've already seen in this class or maybe in a previous class. So, Brian, right? right yes. Brian said that this, this is a producer-consumer problem. Exactly right. What you have is a queue, okay? in which you're depositing messages. So when you have a nice, the send is going to put something in the queue and the receiver is going to take it from the queue. Okay. This is not like a file read and write. I can write to a file and then I can read the file. But when I read the file, I don't take it out from the file. I have to do a separate delete operation. Okay. And because it's a queue, it can be a, a blocking queue, which means what, what Derek said that you can involve this, this can involve blocking till the value has been consumed. Even a file system can involve blocking. It can involve blocking till the data are being written on the, into the file. Okay, so the NIO, you can, you can write something to a file and it'll, it may, it'll, it'll go to memory first and later it might go to disk. Okay, and or it might go to disk or you might block till it really goes to disk so that you really want because you want it persistent. Okay, so in, in transactions you want it to go to some permanent storage. Regarding multiple producers and consumers, actually, remember you gave an answer about uh, observer pattern and, and producer-consumer and you said the same thing. And I told you that even in the producer-consumer problem, you can have multiple consumers and multiple producers. Same thing here. Okay. And, and, and in practice, that, that's in theory. In practice, 
you definitely have multiple producers okay sending messages to one particular mailbox so so that many to one and many to many relationships will exist okay but but uh, um, i kept keep telling you that what we studied in threads is relevant to distributed computing this is yet another way in which it's relevant that the concept of producer consumer and blocking all apply here too it's just that we have we, in, in the observer pattern we were talking of producing consuming in the same within the same thread with the thread thread chapter we went and looked at within the same process and now we are looking at different processes okay and so it's not exactly the same situation so we will learn something new but it's not exactly it's not entirely different so we will reuse some of the things we've seen before okay so so a port is just a blocking or non blocking queue accessible to distributed producers and consumers or there can be one producer consumer there's many variations possible here okay and and indeed data don't have to go to disk before they are transferred so this this can be considered more efficient there was a big debate at one time as to whether it's faster to write something to a local disk or to go and send something on the network um, and and with networks getting faster the latter latter you know is at at, at more of an advantage okay so a shared file does not block data can be accessed at arbitrary locations okay you can just seek to any location and read it whereas here you're talking to a queue and consuming the next item in the queue okay and once an item is consumed it is not consumed by another thread another process okay that's very important at least the way we are going to define the port we can define other mechanisms too but this is what is going to be common among all the abstractions we will study okay. we can build distributed objects that have some properties of files and some properties of what i'm calling a port but i'm just talking about what happens happens uh, what has happened over over the years in history okay so i'm saying distributed object and who knows what what that really means um it means pictorially that multiple processes can access it but what does it really mean to access a distributed object uh we know what it means to access a non distributed object i mean for this is an object in a, in in a, in a process you either create the object and you have a reference to it or you pass it to some other piece of code which has a reference to it so it it you know we know, understand that now we have and so if there are two code components that need reference to the same object they either get it from as a parameter from some other object or they fetch it from some factory we kind of know the ways in which we reference them so the question now is and this is not just ports even to file i'm asking the question of files how do two processes and you can use a knowledge of files here access the same distributed object how can we make sure that both of them are referring to the same object so for instance how do two process how, how do we know the two processes are referring to the same file so in general there is a notion of as you just mentioned this we use we use a name okay and what david also was saying was that we have to use an address and memory okay we can't just use the name directly i mean it's not very efficient as it turns out so what um uh, john uh, john ray mentioned was that you have a file descriptor also okay so file descriptor is an example of an internal name for a file an address okay and the string name is an external name okay and there's a no, so objects shared among processes have external names names that are not bound to some address space a pointer in my process has no meaning to another process okay but an external name is a name that's not not a point an internal pointer to memory address but it is an external thing like a name okay like like an ascii name and so it could be a string for example which is what you did mention or it could be something more complicated it could be host comma string and and both files and sockets when the unix curse came out used used both schemes okay uh which it could be host comma a bunch of ints sequence of ints the sequence could consist of one int or multiple ints okay so so it's just something that is not tied to a virtual memory address Okay, which is what is internal address. Okay, now we can always refer to these names when we want to operate on the, on on a file, but it's just more efficient and 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 
uh, more secure also to get some kind of descriptor to it. So a mechanism is provided to bind a local reference to an external name. Again, with files, those of you who studied Unix have known about the open mechanism. So you say open and you also give access mode. I want to do it in read-only mode or write-only mode and then you can only do reads or writes uh, and you're not allowed to do operations you didn't <coughs> advertise. That's how you get more security also. Okay? And you can cache files. So, so there, is, there are many reasons why you want to go from external name to an internal name. And those of you who use sockets, you know that a socket descriptor is, and in Unix socket descriptor is just a file descriptor. Okay? And you know how you can have an internal socket object in Java that points to an abstract um, external concept, so socket. And there are these bind and connect calls that allow you to go and take an external name and get an internal name for these things. Okay? So that's a common concept that we will, we will have. And what is the host? So host is the location of the distributed object. If that distributed object has a single location. If it's a really large file, it might span multiple hosts, in which case the host will refer to some location, some lo uh, computer that knows where all the parts of the file are, if the host is being used as part of the file name or uh, object name. Okay. So, so this whole notion of external name and internal name is, is, is more general than IPC. And I said a file could be distributed among different computers, at least in new modern, given all this big data processing. But we will assume that a port, the queue is kept at one location. Okay? It's not that the queues should not be so large that they can't fit on, on a particular computer. Uh, there's something wrong with the producer consumer problem there. Uh, they are, you know, the, the, the rates are very unmatched. So we will assume that 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 port, the, uh, the queue is at a certain location and the host, if the host is part of the name, will refer to that, the location of the queue. Okay? This will all make more sense when we look at specific abstractions, but uh, at a higher level, this is what's going on. So just to, um, so let's dive into a little bit of the nature of names. Okay? So, I, I've shown you two alternative uh, naming schemes. One has just string in it, and the other has host and string in it. And I've got my columns reversed here. So, on the left hand is NFS, the network file system. And this has got the host comma string um, nomenclature here, not naming scheme. So, you can say, for instance, host blue tank cs.unc.edu colon home divan my file, okay? So from any location, you can refer to this file by naming my host and naming a name that is specific to that host, okay? So the host has got an address space and it says the home divan my file at bluetang.cs.unc.edu. That's, that's a valid way of naming a distributed file, okay? And, and another naming scheme is provided by AFS where it's just written. Okay, home Devan, my file. You just say that and and it goes to the right. You can go to the right file from any computer that has AFS. Okay. So which do you like? What are the pros and cons? And what's the fundamental difference between the two? So I'm going to use this term awareness and transparency. Okay. So the NFS name is location aware. And the AFS name is location transparent. You know, the word transparent we computer scientists use and my operating system professor, Bob Cook, you know, we said, why, why do we call this transparent? You, you, you can see the host. So when you can see the host, it should be uh, transparent. And actually the host name is opaque. But that's how computer scientists use this term. So in AFS, the, the name is location transparent or location unaware, which is what I like to use. So location unaware name, location unaware or transparent name. So programmer has control over location in NFS. And like Andrew mentioned, uh, in the other case, uh, the system and the underlying file system does not have to find the location of a file. So it's less work, okay? And programmer does not know about file location and, and has to make certain assumptions as Andrew mentioned. 
And the nice thing is that file can be moved without changing programs that access it. Okay, so AFS has that advantage. Okay. Okay, so we are not really studying file systems here. Even, you know, um, there is a whole course on distributed file systems that Don Smith teaches. And you would think that Don Smith would be especially good at teaching that course because I just named a file system here, AFS. And AFS was built at CMU by, uh, by Don's team. Okay. And NFS was built at Sun by friends of mine who went to grad school with me. Okay. So there's a link from me to both of them. Okay. So hopefully I can do a good job here. Okay. But I don't teach uh, distributed file systems. That's what Don teaches. But it's very important to go and um, see this concept uh, because this whole notion of awareness and transparency is we're going to use again and again. And that's, the, that's going to be the fundamental, uh, a fundamental issue uh, that separates many mechanisms that we've been studying. Okay. So let's go and understand what awareness and transparency is. And nobody, as far as I know, has defined this in a general way. People use this term without defining it. So um, this is my attempt. I did it this morning. It probably has mistakes, but, but, but I think I, I've got more, it more or less right. So given an abstraction A and a property P relevant to, it, relevant to its functionality, okay, we can say abstraction A is P aware or unaware. Okay. If it's P aware, it's P aware if it's users, okay, the fun what it exposes to its users. Are, so it makes its users aware of the existence of P or some aspect of P. Okay. So if, if uh, the abstraction makes its users aware of either the existence of a, 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 P, a, a or some aspect of A and then we can talk of degrees of awareness, then it is aware. If its users are not aware of its existence also, forget its values, we'll say it is transparent. Okay. So, so we can have different um, uh, degrees of awareness of P in abstractions uh, external interface. And reducing P awareness in A implies often adding P awareness in some other abstraction, okay, like our, 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 our operating system, okay, or the name resolution system. So given a distributed file name and a location file and its location of the file that is referring to, the name is location aware or transparent if it's user aware, unaware or unaware that is distributed name and some aspect of the location. So I'm, I'm trying to go and do the aware and unaware in the same line because I didn't have much space. What I'm saying is more precise than what I'm uh, writing. So if there is no awareness, then it is unaware. If there is some awareness, it is aware. And then you can have different degrees of awareness. Okay, that's what the true answer is. And reducing location awareness in the name implies adding location awareness in the name resolution scheme. Okay, because the name, name resolution has to then figure out where is it. Okay, so this is pretty much abstracting what we said earlier. And why is it good to abstract it out? Because with this abstraction, we can talk of other kinds of awareness. And we are not going to talk of location awareness as much as we're going to talk about distribution awareness, which is another word for port awareness. Okay, so again, we are talking of um, port distribution awareness of some piece of code. Okay, and the user of the, and we talk, when the, the user here means the programmer who's viewing the code, who's looking at the code, okay, looking at the abstraction. Not necessarily the end user, though we can even talk of the user interface being distribution aware or not distribution aware, okay. And given a piece of code C, producing consuming messages to or from a port, okay. Let's assume that there is some piece of code that is doing some action that results in a message being sent to a port or that results in the processing of message received from a port, okay? That code may or may not have knowledge in it. In that piece of code, there may, may or may not be an indication of whether it's actually talking to a remote uh, process or not. If there's no indication, then we are talking about transparency. And if there is some indication, then we're talking about awareness and that awareness can be of multiple degrees, okay? And if you want to reduce distribution awareness in some piece of code that does talk to some other piece of code, that that awareness has to be in, in some other piece of code. And that piece of code may be in the underlying IPC mechanism 
or it might be in a different part of the program. So you mentioned that RPC mechanisms have no distribution awareness. That's kind of true. There are some pieces of code in the RPC mechanism, uh, in an RPC using process that is unaware, but there are some other pieces that are aware, okay, in at least RMI, okay. And actually, except for one system that I know of from Xerox, every system has some distribution awareness in a distributed program, even with RPC, okay. Uh, so some pieces of program may be more distribution aware than others. Okay, so last time we saw a general model for IPC communication and uh, that model involved a distributed object which was really a distributed queue and we called it a port and sending a message, you could send a message on this object and you could receive a message from this object and that really meant uh, you'd, you put a message in the queue and you removed a message from the queue, okay. So we really have a producer-consumer problem and different IPC mechanisms uh, differ in, 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 in various aspects, one of which is whether they block you or don't block you. Okay, so we saw that a queue could be a bonded buffer with blocking or not. So uh, those, that, that, was, uh, that was the difference and we'll see many other differences. Okay. So one question ar uh, arises when you exchange data among different processes is, is uh, what to do about the fact that the different processes might represent the same data item in different ways. Okay. So if that is the case, how do we transfer data with machine dependent representations? Okay. So in memory, the representation is machine dependent and somehow you have to go from one machine dependent representation to another. Okay. And here's an example. Um, supposing you're talking of the int three and suppose the int is stored in two bytes, okay, then um, one of the bytes will have the number three and one of the bytes will have the number zero. And the question is whether the lower order byte has zero or the higher order byte, the, uh, the higher byte in memory has zero. And different machines have used uh, different uh, approaches here, okay. So there's a little Indian approach and the big Indian approach. So given that, um, assuming we are restricting ourselves to these simple values, atomic values that are not decomposed into smaller units, um, can we really send data uh, between uh, machines that have different representations or do we say, nope, if you have, there are two processes talking to each other, they better be on the same architecture. Yeah, that wouldn't be very nice. So the question is, how can we go and actually uh, support communication among machines with different representations? Okay, so as like Andrew said, the idea is to have some intermediate representations. So he's mentioned that in Java, we have machine independent uh, compilation. And then there is a machine dependent interpreter of that compiled byte code. So we're not talking of byte code, we're not talking of real code here, we're talking of data. So the, our job is much simpler and we restricted ourselves to simple types, atomic types. So we will have an intermediate representation that is machine independent, okay. And we'll call that the external data representation of, of the value, okay? And we will then have uh, routines that convert from a machine dependent representation to a machine independent representation and vice versa. So every host will have uh, a routine that converts out and converts in, okay? Just as every machine, different machine for Java has a different uh, interpreter, okay? Same idea. So the, then the question becomes, what is that intermediate representation? And you can have a binary representation. So for instance, you can um, have the lower order byte sent first and then the upper order uh, byte or vice versa. Okay, and that's binary. And uh, that, that, you know, that's what initial RPC systems did and, and most, lots of them still do today. Um, so we have uh, some agreed upon binary representation of value in a sequence of bytes. And a lot of systems that are designed for the web instead use uh, the textual representation. Okay, so they take the value, convert that into a standard string, find a way to send strings, okay, and then every value is converted into a string, so we, we don't have to, and then convert it into a string and then convert it from that string. Okay. And like I said, uh, lots of web based systems have this. Okay, so that's kind of simple. 
things get more interesting when we talk of non-atomic types and, 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 and especially when these types are uh, defined by the programmer. Okay. So I might have a BMI spreadsheet object with uh, a variable or a property height that's a double object and a weight with a double, uh, which is also a double object. So um, this is programmer defined. I use double rather than, I, I use a double class rather than the double primitive type uh, to indicate that there are pointers here. So um, lots of early RPC systems didn't allow programmer defined types to be sent. Okay. So that, that th these must cause some kind of headache. And uh, it's actually among commercial systems, Java is one of the first to uh, support uh, or at least popularize the idea of sending programmer defined types. So there must be an issue and, and so the question is um, how do we actually communicate such types across the network? Okay. So we will have an assignment, an extra credit assignment where you'll get to implement your own serial, uh, own um, way, of, way of transferring these data types. Uh, so I'm going to talk very abstractly here, more abstractly than the solutions that were given. So yes, indeed, JSON is a way to go and send programmer-defined data types. Um, but the basic goal here, the abstract goal here, is to go and, uh, you know, we have to deal with the fact that there are pointers, there might be cycles, okay? And, and, and so we need to create, uh, we need to basically compose, we need to create an external data representation for a programmer-defined value. And this can be defined in terms of the representations of atomic values. Okay, that's one principle that's, that unites various systems. Whether those atomic values are sent as strings or, 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 or binary values, that's orthogonal. You can do either way. Okay? Whether those objects are key value objects or arrays or, or databases, that's a separate issue. Okay? And what property do we want? We want essentially to take a data structure in memory. We can't just send the pointers across because pointers don't make sense at the other end. But we have, we will we, we basically convert somehow that object to, to a structure, to a graph. Okay, and with, with, with the Java beans, you know, there's a good, there's a JSON way, there's a standard way to convert a Java bean object into a, a JSON record. And, and, but in general, we have some way of creating, extracting the structure of the object and that structure could just be the instance variables in Java. Okay, created from the instance variables. And what we'll ensure is that when the value is reconstructed at the other end, the object or the, or the structure that's created at the other end is isomorphic to the one that was set. Okay, so even if you have cycles, you'll create an isomorphic graph on the other end with similar cycles. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the nodes in the two graphs. So that's a general goal. Okay. This means you have to have some network representation of pointers. And, 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 uh, uh, and so that's, some, that's a challenge in your assignment that, that, that would be extra credit. Okay. And we'll, 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 I have slides and uh, YouTube videos on how, how that should be done exactly. Hopefully we'll cover some of this in class, but if I don't, you can look at that stuff uh, to figure out how to do, the, to, to do this assignment. Okay. So in the context of this, there are two terms that are important. Uh, serialization and deserialization. So even if you don't implement um, that assignment, and I call it the serializer assignment because of these two terms, these are two concepts you need to know even as users of inter-process communication. Okay? And serialization is, as you can imagine, converting something that's in memory, a structure that is that might have pointers, into a serialized sequence of bytes sent over the network. Okay? So, um, and deserialization is taking something that came on the network as a linear sequence and constructing data structure from that in memory. Okay. Sometimes the word serialization is used for both, but there's a serializer, there's a deserializer. And often, the, typically, um, as far as I know, all systems that support serialization and deserialization allow the same routine to be used for both serialization and deserialization. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is this is the definition that I just gave. I won't repeat it. And what you really want to happen is that if you deserialize something that you serialized, then what you get back is something that's equal to what you the original data structure. Okay. 
where the term equal could mean, as in Java, it could be programmer defined, type specific. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so, to understand what that means, let's look at how serialization is implemented. Um, typically, in systems that support uh, this idea, there's a default serializer okay, that will work for some set of types. Okay. So, some of the original RPC systems only supported simple types. Okay. Um, Java will allow you to serialize any, any possible type, okay, potentially. Um, and on top of that, you can write your own custom serializers and deserializers. So not only do you have flexibility in what you serialize and how you serialize at the default level, but you can also overwrite that. Okay, so as Randy mentioned that for a database, you might build something very special. Okay, that's more compact. And like I said, any data structure in Java can be serialized and deserialized because any data structure can be converted into a structure and you can always create an isomorphic structure at the other end. But it may not be meaningful to serialize and deserialize every data structure that, that exists in Java or any language. Okay. So, um, so my next question to you is, can you think of familiar types that you wouldn't want to deserialize and serialize even though a definition exists for deserializing and serializing them? Take the memory structure, convert that into a network representation using some atopic types and create an isomorphic structure at the other end. You just don't think that's meaningful to do and you would flag an error and say, sorry, you know, even though I can do it, I will not serialize or deserialize this error structure because it's not meaningful to do so. Okay. So that's my next question. So um, you guys gave good examples. Um, Again, a default implementation can deserialize and gra graph its cycles. Okay, so a lot of people say, oh, you know, things with pointers can't be serialized, deserialized. No, you can. Okay, so pointers is all right. But anything that is process or host location dependent, especially if it's kept by the OS, is not meaningful to send to the other end. Okay, so. Um, as Chris mentioned, threads, okay, and threads are something that uh, um, may be supported by the OS or by the language, but the OS keeps lots of other data structures, okay, so we saw that files have external names and internal file descriptors. So the file descriptor 3 for one process has no meaning for another process, okay, that happens to be an index in a table kept for that process. The other process will have another table in which three will mean totally different, something totally different. Okay, so um, so those are not uh, IDs of process threads. Okay, as Chris mentioned, so these are all data structures that you could serialize and deserialize, but you just don't create anything meaningful by default. Now you might have a very clever serialize and deserializer that takes a thread ID and tries to create an equivalent thread on the other machine and says, "Hey, this is equal." I don't know if any any RPC system that does that, but we can imagine in, uh, creative systems that try to create something equivalent at the other end. You can imagine taking a file descriptor, sending with it the file that has been that that is connected to, and creating at the other end um, an equivalent file of the file exists, a descriptor to the same file. Okay, so you can imagine doing something clever there, but by default, if you have no knowledge of that data type, you can't see whether you serialize that. Okay, so this is very important when you use IPC mechanisms that allow programmer defined types to be sent. The system might go and say, sorry, I could not uh, serialize this data. All right. Okay. So this brings me uh, to the next question. Uh, what kind of errors can occur when you're using a distributed uh, queue? rather than when you're using, or, or distributed object in general, rather than when you're send, using a non-distributed object. Okay. So there are certain errors that will occur when you access a queue. You might get 
an error saying that you try to read an empty queue if the queue is not blocking. Okay. You would get that error both in the distributed case and the non-distributed case. But what are examples of errors that would occur only in the distributed case? Okay, that's my next question. So then, so I, I didn't, I don't have all the errors that you guys mentioned, but I have many of them. Okay. So, uh, in a single, in a, in a non-distributed case, if a process dies, dies, the whole process dies, right? So, there's nobody to see the error. So, there's nobody to receive an error. In the case of a distributed program, there are multiple parties involved and one party may die and the others may not. So, the other ones then see errors, okay? Which is kind of what you were mentioning. Uh, a host goes down while the other host doesn't. Again, same same situation. Okay, what Jason, Jason mentioned. Remote host may be unreachable. Okay. Some data type may not be serialized, serializable. Okay. And you know, if some machine decides to go and send you something that's not serializable, uh, you may not be able to deserialize it. Um, and this problem occurs more when you're actually getting data from a distributed file that you've been asked to read a file in which doesn't contain serialized data. So you might get a deserialization error. Okay. And I don't have your message corrupting um, errors list here, but those are also examples of errors. Okay. So there's all these different kinds of errors that, that you may encounter. And again, even if you're not concerned about the implementation of IPC, as a user of IPC, you have to be, you have to worry about. So, um, if uh, you specifically are using Java uh, to, to uh, do IPC, and in Java and many other languages, errors uh, come out as exceptions. And Java has this notion of uh, checked and unchecked exceptions, which I think C Sharp also has, uh, but I believe J Java pioneered that. So, my next two questions to you are, what is the difference between checked and unchecked exceptions? And secondly, given all of these kinds of errors, which of them sh should cause checked exceptions and which one should cause unchecked exceptions? Okay, <coughs> so let's go to... So Java has two kinds of exceptions and I'm actually taking text from my 401 slide. And unchecked exceptions. So any exception, if it occurs in a block of code, it can be, or especially in a method, it can be caught or not caught. Okay, if it's caught, then then it doesn't matter whether it is checked or unchecked. The question is whether it was caught in that method or not. Okay, and if you don't catch the exception, and the exception can occur, we can never guarantee whether the exception occurs or not. But if you don't catch the exception, and the exception can occur. In the case of checked exceptions, you have to put in the throws clause that I may throw this exception. So that somebody who calls you can then use that as a form of documentation and try to catch it because if they don't catch it, it will go to the interpreter and, 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 and it can cause... Uh, uh, so in either case, if you don't catch it, it will go to the interpreter. But at least tells them that, you know, such an exception can be thrown and be aware of it. So that's a difference between unchecked and checked. When you guys were saying there's compile time versus runtime behavior difference in the two cases, indeed there is, and this is the exact difference. That at compile time, you will not be allowed to go and write a method that, that uh, does not acknowledge a checked exception if that checked exception is not caught in that method and it can be thrown, okay? Java will never know whether you actually threw it through it or not, but it can make conservative guess as to whether it can be thrown or not. So that piece of code, doesn't access a thread, doesn't do a wait on a thread, we know there's no interrupt uh, exception being thrown. If it doesn't access a file, we know there is no file uh, not, uh, not found exception possible. Okay? So here's an example that we're doing a, um, a read line. Read line is actually uh, can throw an IO exception and in this piece of uh, this method does not actually catch that exception, doesn't have a try catch there. So you must go and say throws IO, IO exception. And that's like an extra value that is being returned to the programmer. That's what an exception really is. And, and the caller of this method can then handle this and knows they must handle it because they saw this in the header. Okay. So that's the difference. 
now we come to the rationale and when java first came out there was no uh, you know it, it was it was not that clear what the rationale was but uh, people have figured out and i think it's been explicitly written at places also what the rationale for division is that's exactly what you mentioned you that um, <coughs> unchecked exceptions are exceptions that are typically typically thrown when there's an internal error okay so um, you, you, you can uh, write an erroneous you can have an erroneous specification of the partition function and that may cause you uh, an accept the, uh, a subscript error uh, you might not uh, have treated an object that you're referencing so you might have a null pointer exception and and so if there are errors that the programmer can avoid then by asking the programmer to go and acknowledge exceptions that they have avoided it's just giving them trouble, unnecessary trouble, okay? But there are certain, so a good programmer should not be penalized by having to do extra documentation and a good programmer should not have erroneous documentation. So we don't want uh, those exceptions that, that, are, that arise because of internal errors to be uh, checked. Now, Java can't figure out whether a null pointer exception occurred because of an internal error or because of something external. So it says if it can be because, uh, caused by an internal error, we'll, we'll make it uh, unchecked. But if the exception is definitely caused by an external agent, an agent you can't control, that means your program is correct, your piece of code is correct, but there is some other piece of code that you don't know about that can make that exception occur, then we make it checked. Okay? So the user might input a file name. The user is an external agent. You try to go and read that file and the file doesn't exist. Your code is not wrong. It's just that the user did something wrong. It's something you could control. Okay? If you did wait, wait on a condition in, uh, wait on a monitor in, in Java and that thread goes and somebody interrupts that thread, that's something somebody else some other threat interrupts that thread. That's something you can control. So we'll make that a checked exception. Okay. So that's the rationale. Okay. And now when we look at all of these uh, errors, um, the question is which one of them could have been um, prevented by the programmer and which could, which, which would not be. Okay. And if you think about this, almost all of them are external errors. Okay. The one exception, one, no pun intended here, the one uh, exception is um, serializable data types. You might, programmer might try to serialize something that's not serializable. Okay, now you can say, oh, they didn't know. It's the data, the person who implemented the data type who's at fault. Okay, but you should really know before you send a piece of data whether it's serializable or not. So it turns out in Java, all of these exceptions are checked exceptions. But you can argue that the send data not being serializable is actually, uh, should be unchecked, okay? So checked, checked, and, and but logically speaking, based on my logic at least here, uh, all of these should be checked and the not serializable exception should be unchecked. But whether something is checked or not checked depends on how you define the exception. If the exception is to, uh, has a superclass runtime exception, then it's unchecked. If the uh, exception does not have as a superclass runtime exception, it's checked. So you can, anybody can go and take, make any exception uh, checked or unchecked. Okay. Okay. We have 10 more minutes left. So let's go and talk about something that... Um, even the common person seems to feel familiar with. Client and servers. I mean, who, you know, there are very few people in this world who would say, oh, we don't know what a client or what a server is in, in, the, in the context of, dist of distributed computing. And uh, yet, when I ask students to define what a client and server are, I don't think anybody so far in all the classes I've taught has got it exactly correct. I'm not, I'm not trying to intimidate you here, but I'm also trying to tell you here that don't think it's so trivial that you don't have to think about it. So my next question is, given all that we know so far about distributed computing, boards, distributed objects, awareness, what is a client and what is a server? 
when there are two processes talk, talking. So the client, in distributed computing, clients and the, the uh, terms client and server can refer to the hosts or they can refer to processes. Okay. So I'm talking about processes here. Okay. So when there are two processes communicating, often we say one of them is a client and one of them is a server. So what distinguishes a client from a server? Why do we call one of them a server and one of them a client? Okay. So I'll, uh, so server versus client communicating process, what does that really mean? Okay, so we did awareness before this, so somehow this is related to awareness. And like I said, you know, the first intuition is um, service, okay? And what is a service is up to you. You know, when you deposit something with, with Facebook, um, you could be getting social media or they could be getting data for the advertisements, okay? So we don't know what service means. So client knows how to name queues access by the server without using an IPC mechanism, okay? So the client, before it starts communicating starts communicating with the server, knows where its distributed queues are. It knows, knows how to name its distributed queue, okay? Whereas server does not know how to name queues accessed by the client. Now, the client can go and access a queue accessible to the server, send it a message saying, here's, here's the way to access my queue. So after communication with the client has occurred, the server might know about the client. Okay, but as such, the server doesn't know how to initiate IPC with the client. And that is the reason why often clients talk to each other through the server, because the clients don't know about each other. The server doesn't know about the client. The clients go and tell server who they are, and then the, the server can then go and relay messages to them or go and tell each, each of them um, references to each other so that they can talk to each other. Okay, so it, it all has to do with awareness. And if clients are always going to talk to the server, through, to, to each other through the server, the server better be on because the clients may want to talk at any time. Okay? Whereas if uh, the server, the client doesn't have to be always on because the server doesn't even know about the client till the client goes and sends it a message. Only after the client has sent it a message saying, hey, this is, this is my queue, does the client have to be on to honor the messages. So all, that, all the things you were saying is actually true, are true. And... You know, I gave you an example of Facebook or Google that, you know, when you go and provide data to them, you are providing them a service and vice versa. I told you guys about the MapReduce problem where the clients will be the ones that will actually be um, performing the service. But before they perform the service, they're going to say, I'm available. You have a problem? Give it to me. So the, the server says, oh, I know who you are. I know you're willing to take a problem. Here's a problem. Okay. And that is how this Getty project works that people all over the uh, world are trying to find, find extraterrestrial uh, life. And, and so the, your, your computers are, the ser are providing the service, but the server is somebody else to whom you, and you contact it and say, look, I'm willing to provide the service and here's my location, okay? So that is the difference between client and server. Okay, we also saw that when there are two, processes talking to each other we might call one of them a client and one of the one of them another server okay and here's a succinct uh, definition more succinct than what we saw earlier definition of what uh, a client and server are so a client has a priori knowledge about the distributed location of the distributed port port uh, that the server uses okay so the distributed port is a server queue and the server queue has to have some way of identifying it. And the client has knowledge about how to access the distributed queue okay, before it starts access, contact uh, communicating with the server. The server can also get knowledge about distributed queues that um, reside in the client, but it has no a priori knowledge of these queues. Okay, so it doesn't have a priori knowledge of these clients that may talk to it. So that's the difference between client and server. And when you have this definition of client and server, uh, where the client has awareness of the server queues and the server uh, does not have awareness of client queues, we can talk of degree of awareness in a client. Okay. So we saw that there are multiple degrees of awareness of remote objects possible. Okay. When we looked at files, we saw that in AFS, you need to know the external name of the file in both AFS and NFS. 
But in NFS, you also need to know the host on which the file resides. In AFS, that is resolved by the name resolution system. Okay. So we can talk similarly about the distributed queues that we are talking about in IPC. And uh, in your next assignment, assignment three, you're going to make your current program into a server and you're going to have clients that access the server. Okay. So your program currently does MapReduce. So you will have actually a MapReduce server that is accessed by clients. Okay. And we can try to go in, a client can try to name the server and its queues by just giving a logical name like com 533 a3 MapReduce server. And that's a location unaware name. Or it might go and say, here's a service name and here's the host name too. Okay. So both possibilities exist. So let's go and look at the more interesting uh, question or possibility where the client has knowledge of the service name but doesn't have knowledge of the host on which the service exists. Okay. So it's unaware of that part. Now we sa said last time that Transparency in one layer or one component often means awareness in some other components or layers. Okay. So if the client, and I'm saying the client doesn't know, the client, the libraries, even the OS doesn't know where that service exists. Okay. And 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 the nice thing about that is that this way the server can ex server can service can move to another host and nothing in the client has to change. So if you're going to have this facility, we have to think of some component that has this awareness. So my question to you next is, what kind of location component must we create? Or maybe we can reuse, maybe you know of some, some kind of server already that, that will give you this, some kind of um, uh, piece of code already that gives you this service um, to support client location awareness. So how can we have uh, un lack of awareness of the server location uh, by changing the picture we have and maybe talking of some other component that will help with the name resolution? Okay. So indeed, we need a mapping between the service names and hosts. We've said the client is unaware of this. So the mapping can be cached in the client, but it can't reside in the client. Okay, so we need a mapping service. We need another kind of server, a bootstrapping server to talk to our this server. Okay, and DNS was mentioned as an example. So we'll call this a name server. Okay, that's a more general term for it. DNS is an example of a name server. And like other servers, it has got queues in it. Okay. And as with other servers, you can talk, you can send messages to it. Okay. And you can also receive, you know, you also want to receive responses from it. You want the map result to be sent back. So you have, I'll also draw arrows in the other direction. And when you have arrows in the both directions, I'll call for a port, I'll call that a distributed duplex port. A duplex port really consists of multiple ports. Okay. Because um, there are ports being used for the names, for the server to go and talk to the, send message to the client. And for a client to be sending messages to the, to the server. Okay, we have two independent queues here. Okay, one, one at the client end and one at the server end. In fact, if a server has got multiple clients, each client has a separate queue. Okay. So um, what are we sending here? As Yuji mentioned, uh, it's a mapping server. So, so this, the real server that you want, the service that you want here, the, 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 the target server will go and say, here's my host and here's a service name. So at this, I'm at this host and I, and I um, provide the service. So it will go and invoke a register operation on the name server saying, register this host with this particular service. Actually, there'll be a host and a port ID that will be both sent. But for, for simplicity, I'm just mentioning the host here. Okay. We can imagine the port IDs being known to the clients. There's nothing wrong with knowing the exact port ID. So, um, and the port ID is really needed because a, a, a host can have multiple servers running on it. Okay, so the different port IDs map to different services. So now a client 
who has only got the service name can send the message to the name server saying, here's a service name. Please tell me how to get to it. I don't know the location, but you tell me how to get to it. Okay. So it'll get back location independent, location information. Once it has this information, under the underlying layer in the client can then go and contact the server. Okay. And this can all happen transparently. Uh, the client code, application code doesn't have to do this. The application code can just say, here's a service name and underneath library can go and contact a name server, get back the actual information and send that in, uh, host specific information and send that information to the name server. Okay. And, and so that's, that's your name server. Okay. And again, I said, this will be duplex codes. So the nice thing about this is that clients do not change if server moves. Okay. That's one of the main reasons. So we, they talk of migration. The server could, if the server moves dynamically after the connection has been initiated, then that's a problem. Okay. But as long, but, but, uh, uh, between connection, uh, establish, establishments, uh, the client, the server can move. Okay. And another nice thing is, that we, we, when we talked of files, we said that, you know, if you give a file name, the file may not exist and then you might get an exception. Here, if you, if you go and send a message to the name server and you get back a host ID from that, you know that service exists. That external name that you had, there is actually a service called com 533 a 3 reduce server. Okay, so, it's, so before you actually start talking to the server, you know that that service exists or not. You don't have to go and try to send a message and then get a message saying, sorry, server doesn't exist. Okay. So, uh, so that's one, that's another advantage. Okay. So this is, this is a design pattern for distributed systems, essentially. Okay. Where we have distributed processes involved rather than different objects in our process. Okay. So my next question to you is, and I'll take other questions that people are burning to ask at this point. Uh, similar design pattern we have seen before. Okay. And I'm, I'm arguing that we have seen a similar design pattern. Okay. So, uh, so let's go to that question now. Okay. So as John Ray mentioned, uh, a name server is like factory. Okay. Uh, we have sense in a sense of indirection. So name server is, remember that factories are used for both singletons and non-singletons. So think of a name server being a factory for singletons. Okay. You fan mentioned that there might be two services with the same name, but that's probably an error. So it should, it should really be a singleton. And, and, and uh, just as in the local case, in the non-distributed case, a factory ensures that something is a singleton. A name server can ensure that something is a singleton by just having storing one reference. Okay. Okay. So let's go and summarize um, what we've learned so far. We've talked about distributed queue. That's the foundation for IPC and send message. You, you know, we talk of sending and receiving messages in IPC and sending is just putting things in the distributed queue and receiving is getting messages from the queue. Okay. Uh, we talked about the fact that different kinds of values may be put in the queue and when these values, when, and then the question becomes, how do you take values from one machine and send them to another machine, given that you have to, the NQ and DQ operation involve a remote machine. Okay. So then we talked about external data representation and, uh, uh, there, there, there's atomic data, external data representation and, uh, external data representation of atomic types. And, and, and for these types, there are both routines to uh, serialize and deserialize these types uh, for a particular machine. Okay. And then when there's non-atomic values, we assume that they can be decomposed by some external default system into a, into a graph. And that system can then make sure that an isomorphic graph is created at the other end. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what these two points are saying. Uh, but not all types can be meaningfully deserialized by default, by this approach. Okay. So there are some data types that have no meaning at the other end. Uh, if we, all we do is send the values, there are, there's other associated state and you, we must make sure that that associated state is recreated 
or we don't send those values. Okay, and 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 so that's to to to, to actually create the associated values. We have um, type specific serializers and deserializers. Okay, so given that all types cannot be serialized, one of the errors that you might encounter when in a distributed communication is serialization error. Okay. And serialization and deserialization also are relevant concepts when you talk of files. Okay. Especially files that can be accessed from multiple computers. So you might want to write file on one computer and read the file from another computer. So you want to serialize the data structure, write it to the file and, and deserialize it afterwards. So you might, you might deserialize something that was uh, not serialized properly. So you can get a deserialization error also. And when you have exceptions, and exceptions are divided into checked and unchecked, then um, then all distribution errors, other than the serialization error, should be uh, uh, checked. And in Java, even the serialization error is checked. Okay. So then there were some naming issues, and we saw that distributed objects have external names. And internal descriptors that point to these names, okay, like file descriptors. These are internal descriptors. Uh, and the name may be location aware or location unaware. And location awareness is a special form of distribution awareness. Distribution awareness says that uh, a code is distribute, uh, aware of, of distribution if it knows that it can talk to a distributed object. Okay. And one form of awareness is location. And given two communicating processes, P1 and P2, we can call P1 a client and P2 a server. If P1 has knowledge about uh, P2's uh, uh, services, a queues, but not vice versa, a priori knowledge. Okay. And we might want different degrees of a priori knowledge. In particular, we might want the client to just know the service name and not the hosts on which the service exists. And if you want that, and if you want no awareness in the whole client, then we want another kind of server that is a bootstrapping server for other server, for the real servers. And that server, DNS is an example of that server, uh, such a server. And in, in, in Java RMI, which you will use in your next assignment, uh, there's an RMI server that you will be using. So, so that's an example of a name server. Okay. And you can think of a name server as just being a distributed factory for singletons. Okay. And a name server allows the server to be moved without changing the clients, okay? And guarantees the validity of certain external service names. If you were able to successfully look up a service name, then you know that service exists so before you try to go and communicate, okay? So in RMI, which you will use, you will use a name server. That's why I need to talk about a name server. Later, we'll talk about customizing your remote procedure call calls using a system I created called Gypsy. And just to be different from RMI and see the design space, we don't have a name server in Gypsy. So you won't have this guarantee that when you use a service name, it really exists or not. Okay, so you'll be able to see the pros and cons of uh, using either approach. Okay. By, by actually encoding using both approaches. Okay. 